Thank you all for coming to this session. We are going to talk about Hyper-V storage. Uh, but before I start, um, I was at the keynote and a couple of other sessions where uh, the presenters spoke something in Spanish. Now, I'm obviously not s from Spain. Um, so I decided I'll learn at least three words. So uh, let me try the first word now. Hola. There you go. So I got that one right, and I'll reserve the, the couple of the next two words for the rest of the session. <clears throat> My name is Matthew John. I am the group program manager for Hyper-V. So effectively, I own the product, the roadmap, and the direction. I'm from the engineering org, so we own the product. Today, I'm going to be talking about storage specifically. And um, so before I start, a few more things that would help. I prefer more interaction when we, are, when we are presenting, talking. So if you have questions, feel free to raise your hands, ask the question while we are there. And I will adjust the pace of the slides based on the number of questions we have. Uh, a bit of history, I grew up in India. So I learned the Queen's English in an Indian accent, then spent about 20 years in US, so my accent got an Indo-American twist. And now I'm in Europe trying to talk to a very diverse set of folks for whom English might not be the native language. So I understand if my language or my accent is difficult for you to understand and follow. Feel free to raise your hands, ask me to repeat, and I'll, I'll try again. But please do bear with me. I know language can be difficult at times. So with that, let's, let's start. Let's start. There you go. You have heard all the news there is about storage, all the big news about, hey, we can do 1.65 million IOPS, the storage cores. The news is already out there. That's not what this session is about. Today, we are going to peel the onion. We are going to look inside at a bigger, uh, at more depth on what Hyper-V is or Hyper-V storage is, how it works, and, and what are the additional capabilities it offers. So just setting the context and expectation, do not expect a lot of new information as in news. You will get a lot of detail, and I would really like the interaction where you have specific questions. I know a few folks already came up and asked me a couple of questions while I was waiting. Uh, and I'm glad that I, was able, I would be able to talk to some of them uh, in this talk as well. So we will talk about how the Hyper-V storage works, why we made certain decisions. And finally, towards the end, I'll actually give a Greenfield recommendation on what I believe or what Microsoft believes would be a deployment option if you were to start from scratch today. So let's, let's start. Let's start with the storage architecture or more about how the flow. It's, it's going to be a very busy slide at the end of it. I'm going to take you step by step. Please follow with me, bear with me. Some of it might seem like OS internals. Others might seem trivial, but it helps to have the complete context. When we talk about Hyper-V or storage or Windows or anything, what really we are building is an environment for an app, an application to run. In this particular case, we are going to look at an application as any application that wants to write to storage. So that could be SQL or IIS or, or maybe even Notepad. So what does an app do? An app wants to write. I have to be close to the laptop. So the app wants to write to a file. The file can be on a file system. It's either NTFS or REFS. The NTFS file system sits on a volume, and the volume on a partition, simple stuff. The partition can be on a disk. The disk can be a manifestation of a SAS or SCSI drive or an IDE drive. So far, so good. And the SAS or SCSI can, can be physical drives attached to it. The drive can also be a fiber channel manifestation or an iSCSI manifestation. Fiber channel implies that it goes through a fiber channel SAN and connects to, a, to an end target. iSCSI similarly goes through the Ethernet and connects to a similar SAN target. 
The SAN target, again, has a bunch of hard drives in it. The file could also live on a cluster, and it could also be on a cluster shared volume. That implies that there are multiple machines connected to it, so the CSV manages the namespaces and provides a common namespace across multiple machines. Uh, the interesting information here is that some of you might, not, might know this, but CSV internally also uses SMB, and that's going to be a recurring theme for us. Where am I? Okay. The file could also be on a file share. We call, we call the component that lives on the client called the RDR. I'm just calling out SMB3 here because that's the latest and greatest protocol. Um, and SMB3 comes with more capabilities, like it can be over RDMA. It can also use multiple channels. I have to be really close here. The RDR connects to the SRB on the file server. The file server has certain capabilities. Again, you might have heard of this called deduplication. The file server also relies on the same semantics that we had here, which is it has a file system, the same file system, NTFS or EFIS. It sits on SAS. The SAS connects to a drives, or it could be on fiber channel. We introduced something called Spaces in 2012. Spaces sits on SAS, and it's a software abstraction of a disk. So below, SA below Spaces, we have a pool of disks, SAS disks, which can connect. Now, Spaces also supports JBODs, just a bunch of disks that can be shared across multiple machines. And when it is shared across multiple machines, you can have Spaces that span multiple machines as well. By the way, everything that you see on top continues to work. So for example, spaces can expose partitions and volumes and NTFS. CSV can sit on it. And thus, you have CSV on spaces, on JBOD uh, architectures as well. Now, if you notice on the file server, the same spaces shows up. And all of a sudden, you can have file servers on JBODs as well. Now, let's, let's pause here. This is great. This is the physical infrastructure. And I just added a new line called, hey, let's turn on Hyper-V. I'm guessing at least some of you have played with virtualization, I'm guessing. So things should become more interesting as we turn on the hypervisor. So in our case, this is Windows. So turning on Hyper-V simply implies I have just slipped a hypervisor underneath the familiar windows, and nothing changed. The whole stack remains exactly the same. So what did we do? We just covered that up and, say, and started calling it the host. So that's the host partition. You have heard of it called root host uh, partitions. So that's, that's, that's pretty much the old uh, Windows storage stack that's built inside the host. Of course, Hyper-V is not interesting without virtual machines. So let's create a VM. Now, the VM runs app applications, and the apps follow the same model. The apps write to file. Files can be on, on the local drive, or on iSCSI, or on a share, or, or on CSV. S exact same architecture exact same building blocks that's available in the virtual machine as well. Now, the NTFS on the partition builds on disks. This is where it gets kind of tricky. So in terms of the storage stack, you will notice that it's still, you have SCSI, you have fiber channel, you have IDE, and, and you have SAS. The key difference is for a couple of those, we have called something called synthetic. Synthetic means it's not real. We have synthesized it. We have created it. So that's where the virtualization components come into the picture. So IDE, for example, it's not synthetic. It's emulated. That means we are creating in, virtually we are creating an emulated drive. Emulation implies that every time a storage I.O. comes to that drive, 
it falls down to the hypervisor, and the hypervisor then sends it to the stores, store VSP, uh, store VDEV, and the store VSP. The synthetic devices, on the other hand, have a pair, a component called VSP and VSC. The VSC lives in the virtual machine. The VSP lives on the host. And notice I've introduced yet another component called the VM bus. It's a high-speed interconnect between the virtual machine and the host that enables us to bypass the hypervisor when we are transferring large amounts of data. So now, with synthetic SAS, synthetic SCSI, and synthetic fiber channel, we have corresponding store VSC, store VSP, and fiber channel VSPs that manage and control and give the, the SCSI semantics. The fiber channel VSP on the host requires a, fiber, a physical fiber channel on the host, so that line connects the two, and it requires NPIV, endport IO virtualization, on the fiber channel for it to be able to work. So fiber channel implies that you actually have a worldwide node name and a port name directly visible inside the virtual machine. Did something happen? All right. So the store VSP. The store VSP now needs to create a virtual disk and provide it. The way we have solved it is by creating a virtual disk from file. And that file is called either VHD or a VHDX file. We introduced VHDX in 2012. The VHDump is a driver or the parser that enables us to create that. Now notice the similarity here. VHDMP acts like a regular application on the host. The files VHD and VHDump sit like any other file on the file system. The VHD or VHDX files can be on CSV, it can be on SMB, it can be on the regular DAS, on NTFS, and so on and so forth. So that's how we are able to build those plug-in hierarchical models. So once we have the ability to parse a regular file and make it into a disk, there are many more interesting things we can do with it. So for example, we introduced native VHD. What that does is the same VHDMP parcel that was used to power the VM's storage can be used as a storage device for the host itself, for the Windows itself. So native VHD, you can mount it, and you can, bring, you can expose that drive into the same Windows operating system. We use VHDMP on the file server. So this is the tricky thing, and, and some of you who might have attended Jose's session might have seen the whole new thing that we have added in 2012 R2 called the shared VHDX, the concept of shared VHDX. What that means is multiple virtual machines which required shared storage can now use the VHD as a backend or VHDX as a backend. And the reason why we are able to make that happen is we just shifted the VHDX parsing from the Hyper-V host to the file server. So if you notice the flow, it goes through the store VSC. So from the virtual machine, the app, the storage from the app goes through the, through the file, through the partition, through synthetic SCSI, through store VSC at the bottom, goes to the store VSP, and now instead of the local VHDMP, it goes through the shared VHDX parser, which uses SCSI over SMB3, gets over to the file server, that's the shared VHDX filter. And then continues with the same VHDMP parser. So we did not reinvent anything. All we are doing is moving processing from one machine to the other. And with this capability, we can now have multiple virtual machines sharing the same block device, or same block device. <clears throat> So the shared VHDX, let me go back again, sorry. So the shared VHDX can also exist on the CSV, so you don't need a file server. You can also have shared VHDX filter on a Hyper-V host and, and have that on a cluster. So it, it requires a CSV cluster, and that's about it. <clears throat> 
And finally, we can also add an iSCSI target. So the file server has an iSCSI target, which is further leveraging the VHDMP parsing and the same storage stack to provide an iSCSI target. And now all of a sudden you have Windows being serviced by the file server if block storage is what is needed. So the bottom line that just got added was for the iSCSI. So this, in a nutshell, is how I.O. flows. I've just added multiple machines to it. So now you have clustered physical machines providing clustering and high availability. The same clustering technology on the file server makes it a scale-out file server. Now let's take a moment here to understand what we just went through. Looking at this slide looks very busy. What we have done is reuse the same building blocks in the virtual machine on the host, on the file server, to provide a very comprehensive and very flexible environment that enables a bunch of scenarios. Too many scenarios that maybe some of you might even start wondering, why do we need all these flexibility and options? So we'll get there. Now having said all these things, Having said all these things, there are a bunch of things that I still did not talk about. We did not talk about Replica. We never talked about VSS. We didn't talk about how simple it is to manage and deploy all those things and monitor with System Center. It's just Windows components. Now, I could not fit all those things into this slide without making it even more complicated. Never talked about trim or spaces or trim and tiering and ODX, a bunch of things. All right, pausing here, giving you a second to take a look at this. All right, now I can move on. So why? Why, why do we have this? What's the benefit of this? This quote, though Isaac Newton, it's kind of attributed to Isaac Newton. It's not really his. It's much older than that. But what it really signifies is the fact that Hyper-V was able to come from behind in the last five years and provide such a powerful environment, mainly because it was able to take advantage and leverage all the innovation that was already part of Windows. And we continue to do that. Every year, or last year we released 2012, and this year, within a year, we have added so much value to it. And the reason why we're able to add this kind of value is because of this reuse of technology and components. Deduplication that was introduced in Windows 2012 could only work on non-live virtual machines. Well, that was an incremental add that we added in R2. And all of a sudden, you get perf benefits, you get scale benefits, and you get capacity savings. And that's just one example. Spaces that was added for Windows Client is now widely deployed on server and everywhere else. So any kind of innovation that shows up, be it for just regular Windows or Windows Server, we all get to take advantage of it. And this code, by the way, helps me ground myself before I get, like I said, I am the Hyper-V guy, so I feel very proud when I walk around and, and people come back and say, you guys did a great job with Hyper-V, awesome. Now I feel good about that, but in reality, the reason why we were able to do all these things is, is because there are many teams across Windows and Windows Server that continue to push the envelope in terms of uh, innovation. So a few examples of what we saw in the earlier architecture. What does it provide? It is flexible. It allows you as a customer to take advantage of whatever storage architecture you have, be it fiber channel, block storage, iSCSI, uh, file-based, SAN, NAS, doesn't matter what it is, or even DAS. Hyper-V and Windows can adapt to that. It provides you with great scale, excellent performance, much better than what any of our competitors have demonstrated. And with this kind of an approach, with this kind of flexibility, we can keep furthering the envelope. <clears throat> so before we jump on to the 2012, let's do a very quick recap of, of what was happening in, 20, in, in so 2012. And for this, let me go to a demo that you guys have probably seen multiple times, but it still helps me 
Watch it again. The million IOPS. So for this particular demo, you have seen this in the keynote, what my friend Liang had set up, and he's the performance guy for Hyper-V. Um, we have created a large virtual machine with 64 virtual processors, lots of RAM. It's, it has connected about 48 SSDs to four SCSI controllers. I can show you the settings. And each of those SCSI controllers has up to four, uh, 12 drives attached to it. So this is an example. There are four SCSI controllers, and each of those SCSI controllers has specific drives, and that's, that's what's powering the virtual machine. It's a regular IO meter test, and in IO meter we have the disk targets, and each of these processes connect to each of those drives and drive it. There's another trick in here. Let me show it to you quickly. We are running up. We started after we started the process, the IO meter. We made sure that each of the processes that are running there are using, taking advantage of the NUMA architecture. So we associate the the processes to the right NUMA node, and this is virtual NUMA. And trust me, that makes a big difference in the performance of the system. So in terms of the test, let's see. Total IOs. And we are doing 8 kilobyte random reads. In 2012, we showed the same test where we were holding around 1 million IOPS. That was with 4 kilobyte uh, IO size. At TechEd US, when we showed this, we could only get to 1.3 million IOPS. Now we can do 1.66. That was like over three weeks. I'm not saying that we will stop here, but this is a pretty good number. Pausing here for a second. I am more a realist as a group program manager. I define what the product roadmap looks like. Personally, I was not very interested in, in having 1 million IOPS as, as a key core feature. Oh, I never started it, did I? Oh, it stopped. Okay. Let me switch back to the demo, uh, to the PowerPoint. So, the reason why I want to call it out is the engineers at the Hyper-V team, specifically Liang, who was my partner in North America when I was demoing this, is one of those guys who's very passionate about performance. And he comes out and keeps bugging the heck out of me, saying, hey, we need to, we can do it, we can, we can do it, let's make it happen. I don't know if there are any customers out there in the audience or anywhere else who really need a million IOPS in a virtual machine. It's, it's a really high number. Now we are 1.6 million. Do we really need it? No. But finally, what it did prove was that people started acknowledging that Hyper-V actually can do these things. Even if your workload requires, say, 300,000 IOPS, that's the high end of most SQL workloads. The fact that we can do six times more than that gives you the confidence that, you know, it's comfortable. It's okay to start deploying my mission-critical workloads in a virtual machine. Now, how did we achieve this? It was simple. Before 2012, we were using a single VM bus channel. We were, limited, we were limiting our queue depth to 256 per SCSI controller. And we had a fixed virtual processor for IO. In 2012, we changed that. We created a, a single VM bus channel per 16 virtual processor. Now, the 16 is an arbitrary number. That can be changed. But we said, let's pick 16 as a number. And per SCSI controller. And we had the 256 Q depth per device per SCSI controller. And we distributed the IO handling. So that enabled the parallelization of transferring large amounts of IO, thus unblocking the system and getting us the high IOPS that's needed. So that's, that's pretty much what we have. There's no secret behind it other than the fact that we just enabled it using massive parallelization. 
VHDX was something else that we introduced in 2012. I'm hoping some of you are using it already. If not, I urge you, please start migrating from VHDs to VHDXs. The benefits are numerous. We designed it from scratch. VHD was a 10-year-old technology that was great when virtualization was being introduced. It was a cool thing for consolidation, but not the right thing for mission-critical applications, not the right thing for, for the future. So with VHDX, you get scale, you get resiliency, you get additional metadata rights, you get performance. It has better support for large sector alignment. So when you have drives that are 4K drives, take advantage of VHDX, which it aligns it properly, and it also exposes this capability into the virtual machine itself. So your application inside the virtual machine can take advantage of, of the actual physical sector size. Now, another quick demo. Let me do a comparison between VHDX and VHD. Specifically with dynamic VHDXs, we'll talk about how good the sequential rights are for a fully populated VHDX versus a VHD, and then we'll also talk about the sequential growth. So here what I have are two virtual machines, one VM on the left. It has two storage drives, an empty VHDX and a fully populated v uh, VHD, sorry, a fully populated VHD and an empty VHD, uh, that is a non-expanded VHD. And similarly on the right, a very similarly configured VM with a fully populated VHDX and a fully populated uh, and an empty VHDX. So the first test that we are going to run is on the VHDs where the machines are fully populated or the VHDs are fully populated. So it's fully expanded. It's a one terabyte VHD, completely expanded. And the tests are running. They are on independent storage controllers, multiple or two different SSD drives. So you will see that we get roughly 40 to 60% improvement just by using VHDX. Exact same test, no difference between the two VHDs. It's just the fact that one is VHD and the other is VHDX. And these are both dynamic VHDs. The next test is to run the same test, but on an empty VHD. This is fully populated. This is an empty and growing VHD. And we are going to be writing large sequential IOs. What, that, what this would do is it will force the VHD or the VHDX file to grow. Now, if, if you are familiar with how dynamic VHDXs or VHDs work, it's a thinly provisioned disk. The biggest hit for any thinly provisioned volume or thinly provisioned disk is when you start writing beyond its capacity, so it has to keep allocating new blocks, grow the file. So the test here is to see how well does the VHD file grow compared to how well the VHDX grows. <clears throat> All right. So we'll measure the total megabytes. Start the VHD start the VHDX, and you will immediately see that there's a 800% improvement between the VHD file and the VHDX file. Just to be clear, let's make sure that we test the files. This is the VHDX file. Oops. And notice the number. It's growing like crazy. And here's the VHD file, which is also growing, but at a much smaller pace. All right.
I hope that kind of helps you figure out the difference where, why, why we keep saying and harping that VHDX is, is, is the right format for you. Here are some of the graphs that show that. When you talk about performance sequential writes, we have between dynamic and fixed and pass-through disks. It's very comparable. So a couple of recommendations that we continue to have, stop using pass-throughs. We are also saying start using dynamic uh, and specifically start using dynamic VHDXs. For 32KB random writes, we see that the, the delta between the two is at least 10% more with, with using VHDX. And VHDX is very similar in performance to the fixed disk as well. And then finally, the growth, close to 8x improvement when we start using VHDXs. <clears throat> So, coming back to Windows Server 2012 recommendations. So as of last year, around the same time, my colleagues were here telling you guys, hey, start using VHDXs, stop using pass-through drives, and start using converged or consolidate your storage to central storage. Now, that last portion is very interesting. Because there's always been this debate about should we have local DAS, should I have SANS, should I have central storage or local DAS? Over the years, as we have started talking to customers, looking at the capability of the hardware, what we have come to realize is moving or offloading storage to centralized location, be it SAN, NAS, is actually beneficial for a couple of reasons. The topmost among them is you want your Hyper-V machines to be as non-impactful as possible. The only thing that should run on it are your tenant VMs or virtual machines. So try to reduce the, the, the CPU utilization or the memory or resource consumption for any non-virtualization related activities. Storage becomes one of that. So decouple storage, move, move the storage off the compute node and keep it in a central location. Converge your fabrics, 10, gig, 10G NICs, and 10G infrastructure is great. And it gives the same level of, of performance and scale that you get from local DAS. So what's new in, in R2? I'm hoping some of you have attended the session that Ben Armstrong and Jeff Woolsey had on what's new in Windows Server 2012. Specifically, I'll go through a couple of them and dive deep into a few of these. VHDX online resize. This is one of those few features where I am sorry to say that I missed in terms of bringing it to you sooner. We have been hearing this request for a while. We were not able to get to it in 2012. And finally, in 2012 R2, we were able to deliver this. Now, what does it do? We are able to grow the VHDX files with no downtime. We are able to shrink it, and it's a safe shrink. Shrink the VHDX with, again, no downtime. <clears throat> it's only supported for VHDX. Hint, hint. That's a theme. Go for the newer technology. And it's only for SCSI. What that implies is to get it working on your boot drive, you need the Generation 2 virtual machines. So if you have a Generation 2 virtual machine which uses SCSI, as your boot device, you can change the C drive volumes and C drive the disk size on the fly while the virtual machines are running. Another quick demo. So for this demo, what I'm going to use is my local laptop. So I have an SSD drive, um, which is good enough for a handful of virtual machines. And we'll, we'll just try to go through the whole notion of how to add drives, what it means to expand and remove. There's a huge storyline behind it, but I probably won't bore you with, with all the details. 
So let's, let's start by adding a data drive first. I like PowerShell. You could do the exact same thing with UI, but PowerShell to me makes me feel like I'm doing, I have more control and I'm more powerful. Uh, but that's just me. So what I've done is I had a pre-created data VHDX with 10 gig of space. While the virtual machine is running, notice here I just added the drive. It was a single simple line command to add it. And I just added it to the SCSI controller. Next, let me try to resize it to a large drive. And I just changed it to a two terabyte drive. Now notice inside the virtual machine in the disk management, you did not see that happen. That's because one I.O. has to happen or a refresh needs to happen for the new disk size to be recognized internally. So I just did a refresh, and you see that I have the whole thing, allocate, unallocated space being created there. I can go ahead and expand this volume to include the whole partition. I, I won't do it now just for lack of time, but you can expand it use the whole volume. You can shrink the volume to wherever space it's possible. And then you can come back and try to reclaim some of the space. So in a real life scenario, what you would do is you have tenants who do not know how much data they need. Prior to this, they had to guess a maximum number and just pick that and pay for that kind of storage. Now you have the flexibility of going in which says, maybe I need 60 gig, maybe I need a terabyte. A week later, you might realize you probably need more or less. And if you're paying by capacity, you can now adjust your capacity based on actual usage. So let me bring it back. So in this particular scenario, the person said, I don't need two terabytes. I just need 64 gig. And when I go in to the thing and refresh, you will notice that it's now the total drive size is just 64 gig. Another scenario you can think of is, what if I try to reduce the size of the disk beyond 10 gig? 10 gig is my actual volume. I don't want to lose any data. So let's make it 5 gig. And what you will see is PowerShell gave an error. UI will throw up a, a similar dialog box which say that it's unsafe. Unsafe because you can't reduce it below a certain point. You're going to write override some of the data, and that's not allowed. At times, you might not even know how, how low you can make it. So we have provided a convenience feature. It's a cool convenience feature. It says, let me reduce it just to the minimum. I have no idea what that minimum is, but take, give me back the, the size possible. And it does that. And reduces it back to the original 10 gig. This would be a good time to upload. <laughs> All right. So that's online VHDX. This is a very interesting topic now. So I'll probably talk a bit on this and then go to the demo. We'll, we'll go back and forth quite a bit. So we introduced storage quality of service. This is new for us, for, for Hyper-V and for Windows in Server 2012 R2. We started off on it this year. And as the asterisk on the top indicates, it's not complete. As in, there are capabilities that are there today but we will continue to innovate and work on it to make it more comprehensive. So what is there and what is not there? So let me be very clear on that. So what do we do today? You have the ability to limit IOPS. What that means is if there are VMs out there that are consuming, say, 100,000 IOPS, and you don't want them to have that many IOPS, you can limit it to, say, 10,000 IOPS or 5,000 or 100. IOPS, doesn't matter, you can just limit it. That just works fully. There's nothing else to be done on that other than the fact that just use it, it works. What else can you do with Quas? Well, you want to give guarantees. You want minimum reserves. So you have like five virtual machines across a cluster. 
and they all are using certain set of IOs, and you want to guarantee that no one else should steal IOPS away from VM1. You want to guarantee that it gets, say, 5,000 IOPS, period. If it needs it, it should get it. It's great. So what we have done is we allow for that to happen. We allow for you to set the reserves on a per host, per disk basis. And once the reserves are set, we will do our best to give that, that, those many IOPS to the, to the virtual machine. Now, it's all possible that the storage target might not have the ability to provide that kind of IOP guarantee. And Hyper-V cannot guarantee what the storage system can do. And this is the work that we have to continue to do with the ecosystem, with the complete storage stack going forward. So let, let me talk about what we can do, and then we'll talk about what's, what's not there. And the final thing that we have added is measurements. We have new metrics that measure these things and provide you with the, the resources for chargebacks and for monitoring as well. So switching over to demo mode. Now here I had a choice of doing local demo versus a remote demo. I'm choosing to do local, but we realize that I have one hard drive on this machine, Windows is running on it, and I have three virtual machines on the same SSD drive, and I'm gonna do a course demo where I'm gonna bombard that same SSD drive with a lot of IOPS. So bear with me, if the demo doesn't go very well, then I'm gonna switch over to a remote machine which has servers running with proper storage set aside for, for the virtual machines. <clears throat> So I have two virtual machines, two identical virtual machines. They both have the same parent VHD. I just created the parent VHD and created two diffs. These are workgroup machines. So they both have exactly the same name, same configuration. The only difference is they have two different VHDs attached to it. And, and those, all of them, as I mentioned earlier, live on the same drive. And this is where the power of, uh, of Quas comes in. So let me start the IOs. And you can see that roughly, I get roughly 14,000 IO on my drive. When I started both those VMs, I get roughly 7,000 each. And this is where the scenario starts working out. So this is, assume this is your data center. You have two virtual machines. You can argue that one VM is good, the other is not so good, and you want to constrain the virtual machine. So uh, a, a VM is taking more than what it's supposed to do. So let me start with the limits. So I'm not gonna do the limit. So for VM1, that is on the left, I'm just gonna set the IOPS to 200. And you will see that immediately, the IOP on the left-hand side dropped down to 200, and on the right-hand side, I got close to 14,000. Back again. That's great. So that's, that's demo number one, where you're trying to limit it. What I'm going to do next is remove the limit so we can look at uh, res uh, how, how the reservation works. So removing the limit, back to zero. So we are back to, to roughly 7,000. Again, let me make sure. All this you can do through the UI. I'll show you how the settings are done. PowerShell is just convenient. Single click and it goes through. Doesn't complicate many things. So now I'm gonna start reserving. And this is within the limits. So when things are good. And here what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna do a limit, a, a reservation for V2. I believe like V2 should get say 10,000 IOPS. And pretty soon you will start seeing that I'm stealing from VM1 and giving it to VM2, and making sure that VM2 gets about 10,000, at least 10,000 if not more. And this is where your reserves are being met. My hard drive had the capacity, or my storage system had the capacity to provide 10,000, so things are great, no complaints. But what if, what if my, either my storage system started behaving like it started 
having some issues and could not deliver 10,000 IOPS. Or I came in and another admin came in and said, you know what, VM2 needs 10,000 as well. If I do 10,000 minimum for both, my storage system cannot handle that. Hyper-V can't solve that problem for you anyway. We can't create from, yeah, we can virtualize many things, but not this. So, so for that, we have events. And let me show you a quick way to show those events. So I have WMI notifications. There's a tool called WBAM test. And I will start a query. And what this query does is it just keeps listening for events. And what I'm going to show you is once I set the I.O. So I'm going to set 10,000 for the VM1 as well. And what you will start seeing is it will try. We will try to give it 10,000, and then we'll fail. And what you will notice is they both balanced out to be around the 7,000 because, hey, there's no priority between the two. Both VMs are equal. But eventually, after we keep balancing it for a while, and it takes about a minute, within 60 seconds, we try to balance our best. We try to see if it is an anomaly. We try to see if it is a spike in usage. And every time we do it, we, keep, we start this internal counter, which says, hey, let me check to see if we can, we can still deliver the promise. If not, finally we give up, and then we raise an event saying, you know what, you have degraded storage quality. Admin, take action based on this. Because it could be that you have over-allocated your resources. It could be that there is some other transient activity, some background activity that kicked off on the storage system, which is not under the control of Hyper-V, that is stealing your IOPS away. And you will notice that event that just popped up, this particular one. It's a WMI event. Double clicking on it and looking at the MOF file, and this is where it gets really deep and technical, so I apologize. You will notice that it says has the, the image pool has degraded quality of service. And that's all it means. It means that there was we could not handle the I.O. requirement. So now if I go back and set it back to normal, assuming things are working fine, I don't know what happened, but my IOP suddenly dropped. Hope there's no other background activity going on here. Oh, it just stopped. OK. So you will find that immediately another event gets raised. Now, this time, the second event is indicating that, hey, things are fine. So it says, satisfactory quality of service has been restored. So things are good. We are, we are in happy territory again. So what, what we have really done here, sorry, there you go. So stop, stop. Yes. Uh, so the question was, the WMI notification, is it possible to see it in the event viewer? I really don't know the question. I know we do generate the WMI notification. I'm not very sure whether we also log an event. That would be a great question. I can get back to you on that. Um, I'm sure we'll blog about it or document it somewhere. So at least a notification that you can listen to. Event viewer, I think that would be a great point. Yep. Yes. So the question was, is storage cores available for shared VHDX? The answer is no. And this is where I talked about 
This is a journey. We have started on it. We have quite a bit of capability that are ready to use now. It's not complete. So there are things that we would like to complete. For example, what we, show, what we saw here was a single machine uh, balancing. What we do not have is our multi-machine balancing. So for example, if my VM1 was on host one and VM2 was on host two, and they both use the same shared storage, then today we cannot balance the I.O. between those two VMs. We can balance the I.O.s on a single host, but not on multiple hosts. So by balancing, I mean throttling. Remember when I uh, recall when I showed that VM2, I wanted minimum of 10,000 IOPS. I took away IOPS from VM1 so that I could give it to VM2. That works great on a single host. If I had two hosts, I could not do that yet. And this is part of the commitment that we have that I want to impress upon you in terms of we keep innovating, we will keep pushing the bar. There are things that we have started and we have that you have the commitment from us that that's the direction we want to take it and we will complete it. So a, a concept that I did not touch upon earlier was I use the term IOPS in there quite a bit. Now, most of you who are familiar with storage realize and understand that an IOP is not an IOP. It's not the same IOP everywhere. So you have 1K IO, you have 4K, 8K, 64K, 1 meg IO. IOs come in very different sizes. Now, we had a choice of making our user experience simple so people can actually configure and use it, or super complex by providing you tons of knobs at the same time allowing you to shoot yourself in the foot. We chose the former. We chose, let's go with, with a simpler model, and we used something called a normalized IO. And this is the mechanism with which we started measuring IOPS. So again, uh, the normalized IOPS we used is only for accounting, only for measurement. When you set a cause parameter, when you set cause, either limits or reserves, you are doing so in, in this number called normalized IO. And what does a normalized IO mean? It means that you're assuming that all IOs are 8K or multiples of 8K. So if you have an 8K IO, we'll count it as one IO. Anything less than 8K, we still count it as one IO. So 4K IO, we count it as one IO. If we have larger I.O., say 16K, like 10K I.O., we count it as two I.O. For the, for the process of measurement, for the process of limiting, we will not split the I.O. So the actual I.O. going down to the storage stack will remain the 10K. But we'll count it as two I.O.s, so when we have to balance it or limit it, we will use that number. If it is 16, we'll use it as two. 23, 24, 3. So you get the picture. Multiples of 8K. Anything less than 8K counted as a single one normalized IO. So this is important because this is how you are going to be setting the course policies on the machine. <clears throat> so how does it work? If you refer back in your imaginary picture that the block diagram that I had shown, the limits, the cause actually is, is being implemented in two different blocks. The cause limits are being implemented by, at the store VSP level. This is above the VHDMP. This is before the parsing. So we implement our cause limits there. We will not send the, the throttling of the IO is done at the store VSP. Yes. And the reserves actually are being implemented at the VHDMP layer. The term IO balancer, we have had that for a very long time, right from Windows Server 2008 R2. It guaranteed fairness across all storage IO rights through the VHD stack. We have leveraged that IO balancer, modified it, and, and allowed it to take weights. And that's where we implemented the reserves. So the reserves are put in the I.O. balancer, which allows it to throttle the I.O.s on, on other virtual machines 
running on the same host until a point where we can no longer satisfy the minimum reserves, and that's when we raise the alert. <clears throat> So storage cost metrics, we use that for chargeback. We have added a few metrics. Two of them can be arguably less about metrics and more about performance, which is the average normalized IOPS in the last 20 seconds. So you go to the metrics and, and, and get that measurement. It will tell you what the average was for the last 20 seconds. It's not a cumulative thing for the whole hour or the four the whole period when metrics were enabled. Same for the latency. We measure that and we give it to you so you can use that for monitoring. The aggregate data written and read are, can explicitly be used for chargeback. So a few more technologies that I touched upon, but I will not go into depth here because there are other sessions dedicated to this. For example, shared VHDX. Jose Barreto had a great session on this. Um, so shared VHDX at a very minimal is the VM sees a shared, shared disk, but it's backed by VHDX. The primary use case for this is the fact that when you have to do any kind of clustering in a virtual machine, if we, prior to 2012 R2, you had to use either fiber channel or iSCSI to enable the shared, VH, shared storage concept inside the virtual machine. The side effect of that was in a hosted environment, what you have suddenly done is exposed the hoster's storage infrastructure into the virtual machine. And we got the feedback that that's not acceptable. People, you guys, preferred that the VHD concept, where it's a file that is contained for the tenant, is separate from the storage infrastructure is the model that we need to go in. And that's the reason why we were able to build this and, and we provide this so that you can keep your tenant infrastructure different from your hoster infrastructure. <clears throat> Other technologies introduced spaces, tiered storage. Again, there was a deep dive on this. If you have not seen this, please go back through those sessions. It talks about the amazing performance improvements that the Spaces team were able to bring forward using tiering. And tiering, in a nutshell, is all about adding a handful of SSDs in front of your bunch of spinning media. And the Spaces technology will automatically determine what are the hotspots and move it between the the spinning media and the SSDs to give you the increased performance. This is both for read and write. And as an admin, you can even explicitly assign files and say this file should be in the hot tier. So, so that you are avoiding this whole notion of trying to have a background task determine that. So you can pin it. Along with, along with tiering, was the write-back cache capability. And what the write-back cache does is it absorbs spikes in writes. So there might be a very short burst of intense I.O. that happens. With write-back cache, the SSD absorbs that and provides the application the, the feeling that my storage system is very responsive and super fast, when in reality, what we are doing is we are accumulating those writes on the SSD. And then in leisure, in the background, we'll start copying those blocks back to spinning media. And these two technologies, tiering and write-back cache, they just work hand in hand. The impact for you is phenomenal. For the storage stack, it's phenomenal. The configuration is minimal. You don't even are aware of, of how to do it. It just integrated into the PowerShell and the spaces management experience. Again, learn more about this. If you want to learn more about this, please either attend. I think the session is probably already over. Or go back to the videos. You will get a lot of tons of information about it. Live deduplication. I touched upon this earlier. Another very impressive technology. 
It's limited to VDI only for now, and I'm sure you have questions about why just VDI, Windows is Windows, why should the workload matter, but it does. Specifically in terms of there's no architectural block here, it's the amount of testing and validation that we could do. In a VDI environment, the homogeneous environment, we were very comfortable doing the end-to-end -end testing, making sure that the performance benefits that it offered does not degrade reliability or any other concerns that we might have. In the case of server, the workloads are a lot more varied with IIS workloads and SQL and SAP. So we need a lot more time testing and making sure that we are not introducing any regressions there. But in terms of technology, there's no limits. If you decide to use it, you could use it. We will not support it, but it will just work. Now, this is, again, an incredible technology. The reason being, as Jeff demonstrated in the keynote, you are not only getting performance benefits, you're also or capacity benefits, but you're also getting performance benefits, almost two to one. The VMs were able to start up much faster because of the shared blocks, and those blocks can get cached and be read again and again. So the speed, the boot up time for VMs, especially in VDI cases, were much faster with this. More detailed in that session on storage cost with data dupl deduplication. Please attend that, get more details around it. So, so dedupe just works on file servers. Please do not turn it on on the host, on the Hyper-V host. We really do not want any kind of extraneous processing to be done on the Hyper-V host. Leave the host for virtual machines. Yet another reason why centralized storage, separate out storage and compute. So, after all this, where does that leave you? We have a very powerful system. It's incredibly flexible. It's like giving a loaded gun to someone and saying, hey, go party on, play with it, because you can very easily shoot yourself. There is a lot of value in having this kind of flexibility in the system, but we also know that with flexibility comes complexity. I have had people come to me and ask me multiple times, all right, I'm going to start scratch fr fresh. What should I be doing? Don't tell me that you could do SMB, you could do file server, you could do fiber channel, iSCSI. It's complex. Don't tell me all of this. Just tell me one thing. In fact, internally, MSIT comes to us, Azure, and, and other internal private cloud deployments within Microsoft all come back to us saying, all right, so what are we really, really, really saying? And that's where we went back and said, so what, what do we want our customers to do if they're going to start from scratch? Now, some people in the crowd who are hard and fast block storage guys or with SANS might not agree with my next slide, which is this is really what I recommend. Have a simple file server, scale out file server, please. And connect your host to the scale out file server. Try to have just a bunch of this JBOD behind the file server connected using spaces. You have everything that you need in this kind of an architecture. But this is where it gets interesting because every customer has a unique scenario. Some might say, but I already have invested in fiber channel. Then have a fiber channel. You can have a fiber channel SAN connected to the file server. But if you have fiber channel deployed everywhere, we can go back to the previous slide and say, sure, go for that deployment. It's 100% supported. It works, and we will stand behind it. But if you're starting from scratch, try to build the simplest model possible that satisfy your needs. You can always make it more complex as you go along. So I'm sure I'll get a bunch of questions after the session on this, but that's fun. All right, so, so that was it. Um, key takeaway. And this is pretty much my last slide. We take storage virtualization very seriously. Virtualization for Microsoft if you have not realized, is, is very strategic, critical, and of utmost importance. If you have listened to Steve Ballmer talk about what Microsoft strategy is, it's devices and services. Microsoft is betting its services 
on virtualization, specifically on Hyper-V. We understand that the industry is moving towards clouds, and most of those clouds with AS and PaaS are built using virtualization, and we want it all to be with Hyper-V. You have heard the three cloud strategy, private, hosted, and public. That's virtualization, that's Hyper-V for us. Microsoft has one virtualization technology, that's Hyper-V. We want it to work well. It's not, so while we really love you guys, customers, what I'm trying to share with you is there's an interior, ulterior motive that we have. For us to succeed just with our own solutions, we have to make sure that Hyper-V works and works well. Storage is an incredible key component of virtualization. There's much work to be done there. It's one of the top cost generators for any kind of deployment. And we will continue to innovate, trying to bring the cost down, trying to bring all sorts of innovation to improve capacity, to improve performance and scale. So, so with that, I just have a couple more slides that talk about uh, logistics. That's all the related content we have. I'm not going to leave it there. I'm sure you guys have it. I'll bring back to it. Um, there are a bunch of resources available online and after the session. Please follow through with that. Would really appreciate your feedback on how the session went, the content of the session, me as a speaker. It would help me be a better speaker for the next time around. So really appreciate that. And that's pretty much the last slide I have. So thank you. And as I promised, the two other Spanish words, gracias and chao. There you go. Thank you.